Welcome to this video analyzing the poem by Tom Gunn, The Man with Night Sweats. It is my opinion that this poem's purpose is to encourage compassion in the reader and have us intimately understand what it feels like to suffer with a terminal illness. The Man with Night Sweats. The title does not provide a name for the character who is suffering. We are all susceptible to illness. The man in the poem is dying. It's a deeply saddening poem. His body is weakening and in the middle of the night he is experiencing cold sweats, one of the symptoms of the severely developed AIDS virus on the body. It's important to note that our knowledge and understanding of HIV and AIDS over the past 30 or 40 years has changed dramatically. It's a deeply saddening poem. It's a poem where the reader is witnessing the demise of a man's health as he suffers from the AIDS virus. And in this poem, we witness a man waking up in the middle of the night, scared and fearful about losing his life. The man with night sweats. I wake up cold, I who prospered through dreams of heat, wake to their residue, sweat and a clinging sheet. My flesh was its own shield, where it was gashed, it healed. I grew as I explored the body I could trust, even while I adored the risk that made robust a world of wonders in each challenge to the skin. I cannot but be sorry. The given shield was cracked, my mind reduced to hurry, my flesh reduced and wrecked. I have to change the bed, but catch myself instead, stopped upright where I am, hugging my body to me, as if to shield it from the pains that will go through me, as if hands were enough to hold an avalanche off. I think you would agree from hearing the poem that this is a deeply saddening poem and one that deserves our respect and compassion. Okay, so on to the line by line analysis. The first line is presented in first person voice, creating an intimate tone, inviting us into the speaker's world. Notice the caesura in line one that provides us with a pause after the word cold. It's my interpretation that this provides imagery and creates a uncomfortable tone. Notice the contrast between cold and heat. This is the first conflict that we see in the poem. The second conflict, and also in the form of a contrast, is between the word prospered and later in the poem where we see the word wrecked, talking about the man's health. The third conflict is between the present and past tense. Uh, they're constantly blended together as he remembers the life he once had. I wake up cold, present tense. I who prospered through dreams of heat, past tense. Residue is ambiguous. Remember, ambiguous refers to something that can be interpreted in multiple ways. The reason I'm arguing that it's ambiguous is because it could be referring to the physical sweat, the moisture that he is feeling as he wakes up. But it could also be to do with the residue of his dreams. This could be referring to uh, his dreams in life, his hopes for the future, which are now residual. He could also be talking more literally about the dreams or perhaps nightmares that he's having as he wakes up. Uh, 
Um, an interesting point here about form. You notice the whole poem is written in quatrains and couplets, which just means four lines or two lines. They're often rhyming. Um, you see, who, residue, heat, sheet, and shield, healed. So we've got an A, B, A, B rhyme scheme in stanza one. And then in stanza two, it moves to a rhyming couplet, shield and healed, uh, rhyming fully. I would argue that the tight form of the poem is here mirrored in the personification of the clinging sheet. In this first rhyming couplet, stanza two, we note that he refers to his skin or his flesh as a shield. Uh, this is the first use of this metaphor, which we're going to see three times throughout the poem. The metaphor of a shield represents his ability to shield himself from harm. He talks about his skin, his flesh, being gashed. And when it was gashed, it healed. This has an aggressive tone, in my opinion, perhaps mirroring the aggressive nature of the HIV virus. Note the simplicity to the caesura. It's the third caesura of the poem so far, one coming after the word cold, another one coming after the word sweat, and this third one coming after the word gashed. He's reflecting back on his life and remembering a time where even if his skin was gashed open, his body would have the immunity to heal it. However, he's implying here that this is no longer the case. Stanza three returns to a quatrain, but notice the absence of cesura in this stanza. There's no punctuation until the very end of the stanza. The entire stanza uses enjambement, perhaps to mirror the exploration of his identity. I grew as I explored the body I could trust, even while I adored the risk. As mentioned, this stanza uses enjambement. Uh, remember, enjambment is just where the line flows from one line to the next without any pauses at the end of the line. Perhaps this mirrors the growth of the speaker. We're not exactly sure about the risk that he adored, but perhaps uh, this is referring to unprotected sex, which is, of course, how the virus was mainly transmitted in the 80s. Perhaps one of the takeaways from the poem, one of the messages from the author, would be to practice safe sex and to be aware of the risk um, that not doing so holds. Alliteration and enjambment is continued. Uh, the risk previously mentioned develops now into a world of wonders. Uh, this could be challenging the speaker's identity uh, or, as mentioned, referring to the sensual passions of touch and caress. Stanza four then starts with a tone of regret, uh, mourning for the loss of something. I cannot but be sorry. Second time, the speaker's shield is mentioned, whereas before it healed, now he is suffering from the HIV virus. He knows that it will not heal in the same way. The onomatopoeia in crack, for me, signifies a shift. A sense of panic results, perhaps, at receiving the positive diagnosis. My mind reduced to hurry. My flesh reduced and wrecked. Again, this is referring to the demise of the man's health. There's a very destructive tone in crack and wreck and reduced. In this couplet, I have to change the bed, but catch myself instead. Now, changing the bed is normally a, a mundane chore that you do uh, from week to week. However, here, this need to change the bed in the middle of the night 
Sounds harsh, lonely and depressing. We feel for this man and we wish that we could help him, but we're helpless spectators of a ravaging virus taking hold. He states that he uh, catches himself. And this is a phrase used to refer to a moment of realization, a sudden memory. And in this case, the memory is that he's actually suffering from this really, really debilitating virus. I catch myself instead stopped upright where I am hugging my body to me. He stops and puts his arms around himself. There's an image of vulnerability. Perhaps the adjective to describe his bodily position, stopped, uh, could allude to the power of the virus in uh, stopping his normal life from continuing. Interesting use of the description of him standing upright. I normally interpret this word as a confident posture. However, um, perhaps this could symbolize him forgetting just for a moment that he is suffering from this virus. Again, another example of contrasting imagery. For me, this is a really, really profound image. This sense of despair and loneliness of somebody standing alone, feeling ill in the middle of the night, fearful of what the future holds. Nobody would normally witness this moment of suffering. And so here, poetry is being used as an art to bridge the gap between suffering alone, intimate sadness, and expressing what this is like to a wide audience. I feel like this is one of the ways poetry can be really powerful in acting as a bridge between worlds. Again, this third use of shield mentioned it earlier. He's trying to fight the virus, but here it is preceded by as if, as if to shield it from the pains. And you'll notice at the end of this final part of the poem, as if is repeated again, perhaps uh, conveying the futility of trying to fight this virus, as if I can fight this virus. The pains are pluralized, which perhaps represents the multiple side effects of the virus, which at a late stage of development do affect the immune system and a range of symptoms are triggered. There is a sense of inevitability, trying to shield himself from the pains that will go through him, that will go through him. It's definite, it's certain. As if hands were enough to hold an avalanche off. For me, this is a terrifying and deeply saddening metaphor. He repeats the phrase, as if, and he expresses the stark fact that this virus will kill him and his bodily defences will fail. The metaphor in the final line really, really does represent what it felt like for sufferers of the virus. It was really like fending off an avalanche with your bare hands. And just a final note that this poem was written by John Gunn who had many, many friends who lost their lives to the HIV and AIDS virus. And so we can interpret this poem as an elegy to commemorate those friends that he lost. Uh, just a quick question for you to think about perhaps uh, later on. What do you notice about the symmetry of the rhyme scheme and structure in general? We talked a little bit about this, but just very quickly, we go a, B, A, B, C, C, D, E, D, E. And so just from looking at that on the screen, you can see that there's a symmetry there, uh, consistency to the first three stanzas. We look at stanza four, and again, the consistency continues. However, this is the moment I was referring to that I believe is the turning point in the tone and where hope is beginning to be lost. G, H, I, J. So, sorry stops rhyming with hurry, crack stops rhyming with wrecked. This uh, harmony is not balanced anymore. Let me see, uh, consistency attempting to return. However, it does not. 
uh, am does not rhyme in any way with from, and me and me aren't the exact same word. So the structure really sort of falls apart at this point. And the final two lines, again, perhaps a half rhyme, we could call it enough off. Significant also um, to perhaps symbolize loss of life. So your next task will be to stick this poem into the left hand side of a poetry portfolio like the one you see on the screen. This is a different kind of portfolio, but you get the picture. So left hand side, we're going to be sticking in the poem and annotating it around the outside. And on the right hand side of the two page spread, we're going to be writing notes answering these four questions. What happens in the poem? What are the events of the poem? What characters feature? What's the tone of the poem? That means mood and atmosphere. What's the form of the poem like? That's like structure and rhyme scheme we talked about. What's the message of the poem? Are there multiple messages? You decide.